It's time for the three question warm up for Biochem 7. Let's get going. Which zoonotic bacteria fit the following description? First one is causes cat scratch fever, that's going to be Bartonella. Causes Lyme disease, that's going to be uh, Borrelia burgdorferi. Causes recurrent fever from variable surface antigens, that's going to be Borrelia uh, recurrentis, and it's from ticks and lice. Causes bloody diarrhea, that's going to be Campylobacter, and this is transmitted by potentially puppies or other uh, types of pets. Also, livestock by fecal oral ingestion, and also by sexual transmission as well. Causes Q fever, that's going to be uh, Coxiella burnetti, and that's transmitted by spores uh, from tick feces and cattle placenta, gross. Causes tularemia, think about rabbits, and that, uh, that's going to be rabbit bites by that uh, Franciella tularensis. Leptospirosis, think of Leptospira, species transmitted by animal urine. Causes cellulitis, osteomyelitis from cat or dog bites, think of Pastorella multicida. Next, what are the findings of brown saquard syndrome? So you're going to have ipsilateral upper motor neuron signs below the lesion, ipsilateral dorsal column loss of information below the lesion, you're going to have contralateral pain and temperature loss at about two to three segments below the lesion. Also, it's going to be ipsilateral pain and temperature loss at the level of the lesion. You also have lower motor neuron signs and also flaccid paralysis. So both upper and lower motor neuron signs because the lesion uh, is of the cortical spinal tract and the anterior horn. And there's also going to be a loss not only of pain and temperature, but also of all sensation ipsilaterally at the level of the lesion. That's a hard question, so go through that a couple times. Next, what drug prevents the release of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum of skeletal muscle? The answer is dantrolene. All right, that's it for the warm-up. Let's get to that lecture now. What has two thumbs and loves studying biochemical pathways? Not this guy. For the next several videos, we're going to talk about various mechanisms our bodies use to generate ATP. And why do our bodies need ATP? Because ATP represents energy. ATP is the primary energy currency of our bodies. And the reason we need energy is that some chemical reactions consume energy and other chemical reactions give off energy. So we call the energy consuming reactions endergonic reactions. We call the energy releasing reactions exergonic reactions. So life itself is basically an energy consuming process. Life requires a ton of these endergonic energy consuming reactions. And the only way an endergonic reaction can take place is by coupling it to an exergonic reaction. So when you take a molecule of ATP and you break off one of those phosphate groups, that's an energy releasing or exergonic reaction. So going from ATP to ADP releases a little energy, and then going from ADP to AMP releases energy, and so on. So if ATP represents energy that our bodies can use, how do we make ATP? Now, you don't need to write all this down, but I want to give you a big picture overview of where we're headed. So we're going to work backwards from ATP. To make ATP, you need to add a phosphate group to ADP. In other words, you need to phosphorylate ADP. This is a process called oxidative phosphorylation. We're going to couple that to the electron transport chain. We're going to go over that in another video. Don't really worry about it for now. Remember, we're just talking about the big picture. So again, working backwards, the electron transport chain requires some electrons. We get those electrons from NADH. NADH is an electron donor. Now, when NADH donates an electron, it becomes NAD+. So for the electron transport chain to work, we need a steady supply of NADH electron donors. And that's one of the big functions of the TCA cycle. Now, the TCA cycle also makes a little bit of ATP, but the main purpose is to generate NADH. And again, we're going to cover the TCA cycle in another video. Working backwards one more time, what do we need in order to keep the TCA cycle going? Acetyl-CoA. So as long as we have a steady supply of acetyl-CoA to drop into the TCA cycle, we can keep making NADH to feed the electron transport chain and make ATP. And acetyl-CoA comes from the decarboxylation of pyruvate. And pyruvate is generated from glucose through the process known as glycolysis. So that's going to be our focus for the rest of this video. How do we convert glucose to pyruvate? And it just so happens that glycolysis also produces a tiny bit of ATP and also a tiny bit of NADH. But the problem is that glycolysis takes place out in the cytosol, and the TCA cycle in the electron transport chain takes place in the mitochondria. And the NADH can't pass through the mitochondrial membrane. So there are a couple of different mechanisms to shuttle NADH and other electron donors into the mitochondria. And which shuttle mechanism and which electron donor you use impacts how much ATP is going to be produced. Now, oxidative phosphorylation in the electron transport chain use oxygen, and they produce a lot of ATP. But again, those processes take place in the mitochondria. 
Some cells don't have mitochondria, such as red blood cells. So red cells can't convert pyruvate to acetyl-CoA and then run it through the TCA cycle of the electron transport chain. All red cells can do is glycolysis, which is anaerobic metabolism. Anaerobic metabolism of glucose is fairly inefficient. It yields a net of just two ATPs, as we're going to see shortly. Now, most of the other cells in your body will metabolize glucose aerobically, using oxygen, using the TCA cycle and the electron transport chain. And again, there are different shuttle mechanisms and electron donors involved. Cells that use a shuttle called the malate aspartate shuttle can generate a net of 32 ATPs for every glucose mo molecule that they metabolize. So 32 ATPs per glucose. And then the cells that use a glycerol 3-phosphate shuttle can only generate a net of 30 ATPs, which is still really good, just a little bit less than that malate aspartate shuttle. Now, cells in the heart, liver, and kidneys generally use the malate aspartate shuttle, while the brain and skeletal muscle cells generally use the glycerol phosphate shuttle. So let's dig into glycolysis. The first thing a cell has to do before it can metabolize glucose is transfer it from the circulation into the cell. There are various types of glucose transport proteins, which are called GLUT proteins, or glucose transporters. So there's GLUT1, which are found on red cells and also on the endothelium of the blood-brain barrier, in addition to many other tissues. Now, GLUT1 is important because it mediates low-level basal glucose uptake. Uh, this allows cells to take in glucose whether or not insulin's around. So this makes sense because red cells have to have glucose. It's the only energy metabolite they can use, so they have to have glucose regardless of the presence of insulin. Now, GLUT2 transporters are found on cells that regulate glucose, such as hepatocytes and the beta cells of the pancreas, although there's some evidence that on beta cells, GLUT1 may actually be more important for stimulating insulin release. GLUT3 transporters are found mainly on neurons and also on the placenta. GLUT4 transporters are found on skeletal muscle and adipose tissue, and these are the transporters that require insulin. So the GLUT4 is very important. Uh, this is the insulin-dependent glucose transporter. Then there's also a GLUT5 transporter that's responsible for fructose uptake, especially in the GI tract. Once you have glucose inside the cell, you need to trap it there so it doesn't go anywhere. And you do this by phosphorylating it. So you add a phosphate to glucose so that it becomes glucose 6-phosphate inside the cell. And then once it becomes glucose 6-phosphate, it's trapped in that cell. And we've said that enzymes that phosphorylate things are called kinases. And there are two enzymes that can phosphorylate glucose and other 6-carbon sugars like fructose, hexokinase and glucokinase. So let's start with glucokinase. Glucokinase is unique to cells that regulate glucose, just like we saw with GLUT2 receptors. So glucokinase is found in the liver and also in the beta cells of the pancreas. Now, glucokinase has a very high Km, which means it needs a lot of substrate to hit a decent velocity reaction. So you need a lot of glucose around in order for glucokinase to work. But it also has a very high Vmax, which means that once it does start working, it works very quickly and very efficiently. So when there's a lot of glucose around, it makes sense to have an enzyme that can handle that large amount of glucose. When there's not much glucose around, you don't want the hepatocytes to take up glucose and store it. You want them to share the glucose with other tissues. So that's why a high Km is very important for glucokinase in the liver. Now you can use the L in glucokinase and the L in liver to help you remember that glucokinase is found in the liver cells. Now what about hexokinase? Hexokinase also generates glucose 6-phosphate, but it has a low Km and a much higher affinity for glucose. In other words, the concentration of glucose doesn't have to be very high for this enzyme to work. Even when glucose levels are very low, hexokinase will be able to trap that glucose that is there, uh, trap it in the cells by phosphorylating it. And it has a low capacity and a low Vmax. And hexokinase is not induced by insulin, whereas glucokinase is induced by insulin. So again, the first step of glycolysis is to phosphorylate glucose to G6P. So let's talk about the glycolytic pathway. Now this is number four in your study guide. It's enough to make your head spin, isn't it? The good news is you don't have to know everything about this pathway. So let's talk through what you do need to know. The first step is letter A is either hexokinase or glucokinase, which makes letter B glucose 6-phosphate. Then glucose 6-phosphate goes to letter C, which is fructose 6-phosphate. And that's converted to letter D, fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, so 2-phosphate. And the enzyme that does that is a very important enzyme. It's phosphofructokinase 1, or PFK1, which is letter E. Now, PFK1 is important because it's the rate limiter of glycolysis. It's very important to know the rate-limiting enzymes in these pathways. So certain steps in this pathway are very tightly regulated, and this is one of them. You need to regulate when glycolysis is and isn't taking place. So when would you want glycolysis to take place? 
you would want cells to be able to break down glucose and generate ATP when they're starving for energy. So ATP is a molecule that will stimulate PFK1. The letter F is AMP. When there's a lot of AMP around, that means you've already broken down ATP to ADP and then ADP to AMP. So AMP is a signal that there isn't much ATP around, and that stimulates PFK1. And then letter G is another molecule that stimulates PFK1, which is fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. So G is fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. We're going to talk about that a little bit more later. Then the other way to regulate PFK1 is to inhibit it. So what's going to inhibit PFK1? Well, high energy states. So letter H is ATP. If there's already a lot of ATP around already, you don't need to make more of it. Another thing that inhibits PFK1 is citrate, which is letter I. So citrate is a substrate of the TCA cycle. So if you're overwhelming the TCA cycle, there's a huge amount of extra citrate around that's going to cause a feedback inhibition of PFK1. All right, there's nothing to fill in for the next couple of steps so we get a little breather. Fructose 1,6-phosphate, which was letter D, gets split into two things, glyceraldehyde, 3-phosphate and dihydroacetone phosphate, or DHAP. But DHAP can be converted to glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, which means that for every glucose that you started with up at the top, you get to go down the bottom half of the pathway twice. And take note, you have to use energy to add phosphate on two of those previous steps. And now that you're splitting that 2-phosphate sugar into two different molecules, and in the second half of the pathway, each time you go through it, you're going to generate two ATPs. So you put in two ATPs, but you ultimately get four ATPs out. So that's why we said that anaerobic metabolism generates a net of two ATPs. So moving on down the pathway, you go from glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate to 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate to 3-phosphoglycerate to 2-phosphoglycerate, and then you get to letter J, phosphoenolpyruvate, or PEP. And the enzyme that converts PEP to pyruvate is letter K, pyruvate kinase. Now this is another heavily regulated step. The substance that stimulates pyruvate kinase is fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. That's letter L, fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. We saw that earlier as substrate D. So an upstream substrate is stimulating the downstream mechanism, which makes sense because you don't want these substrates building up. And then letter M is ATP, and then N is alanine. And again, these ATP and alanines are, are going to indicate that you already have a lot of energy. You don't need to make any more pyruvate. So that's going to inhibit pyruvate kinase. So again, the key enzymes that you need to know are A, E, and K. Letter A was hexokinase and glucokinase. Letter E was PFK1, or phosphofructokinase 1. And letter K was pyruvate kinase. So those are the three main glycolytic enzymes important for you to know for your test. We're going to look at the gluconeogenesis side of this diagram in another video. Let's look at some clinical aspects of the glycolysis pathway and consider what would happen if you were deficient in some of these enzymes. So look at number five in your study guide. These patients are going to present with hemolytic anemia. So think about it. Red cells don't have mitochondria, so they have to be able to metabolize glucose in order to make ATP. So if there's a problem with this glycolytic pathway, the red cells can't make ATP, so the sodium-potassium ATPase won't work, and that means that they can't regulate sodium and potassium homeostasis, and the cells are going to swell and then lyse. And as red cells lyse, that results in hemolytic anemia. So what causes this? Well, pyruvate kinase deficiency is the most common glycolytic enzyme deficiency, and that's the one you should know for your test. Pyruvate kinase deficiency. Now look at number six. A muscle biopsy reveals elevated glycogen levels, elevated fructose 6-phosphate, and decreased pyruvate. So what's the enzyme deficiency? Well, because pyruvate is decreased and because glucose is being stored as glycogen, you know there's a problem with glycolysis. So you have to think about which of the glycolytic enzymes would be deficient. Because you have an elevated level of fructose 6-phosphate, this suggests a deficiency of the enzyme that converts fructose 6-phosphate to the next substrate. So what enzyme was that? PFK1. So this is a deficiency of PFK1. Now let's dive a little deeper into the regulation of glycolysis, specifically by fructose 1,6-bisphosphate and fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. Well, it's made from fructose 6-phosphate by phosphofructokinase 2, or PFK2. So not PFK1, now we're talking about PFK2. So fructose 6-phosphate can either be converted to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate by PFK1, which is the normal glycolytic pathway, or it can be converted into fructose 2,6-bisphosphate by PFK2. So that's not too difficult to remember, right? Now one other concept to understand is that when you eat, when you're in a well-fed state, that stimulates release of insulin. And insulin will stimulate PFK2 to make more fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. 
which in turn will stimulate glycolysis by stimulating PFK1. So insulin does not stimulate PFK1 directly, but it stimulates glycolysis by stimulating PFK2. Then what about the fasting state? In the fasting state, instead of releasing insulin, you start releasing glucagon. So glucagon has actions that oppose insulin in a lot of different ways. So instead of stimulating PFK2, glucagon stimulates an enzyme called fructose bisphosphatase 2, or FBPase 2, which converts fructose 2,6-bisphosphate back into fructose 6-phosphate, which can then be used for gluconeogenesis. Because when you're fasting and glucose levels are low, you don't want to break down glucose through glycolysis. You want the liver to start making glucose through gluconeogenesis. So glucagon stimulates the conversion of fructose 2,6-bisphosphate to fructose 6-phosphate, and it shifts everything toward gluconeogenesis to raise the blood glucose. Now let's clarify how glucagon stimulates FBPase 2. Let's look at number seven. How does a low insulin, high glucagon state inhibit glycolysis and lead to conversion of energy? So what happens is that when you are fasting and blood glucose drops and glucagon rises, you have a low insulin to glucagon ratio. So glucagon binds the glucagon receptor, which is a G-protein-linked receptor that stimulates adenylate cyclase. Remember all that? It's back. Well, what does adenylate cyclase do? It converts ATP into cyclic AMP. So then cyclic AMP is going to activate protein kinase A, which phosphorylates the enzyme FBPase 2 and activates it. Now I want to switch back to this image for just a second. This is the reaction we're talking about. And you can see the two enzymes which can drive this reaction in one direction or the other. Now, the part that may blow your mind is that fructose bisphosphatase 2 is part of the same enzyme complex as PFK2. So it swings both ways. It's one enzyme with two separate functional domains. And whether or not the enzyme is phosphorylated determines which domain is active. So when you're in the fasting, high glucagon state, and protein kinase A has been activated, this two-way swinging enzyme is phosphorylated, and that turns on the FBPase 2 domain and turns off the PFK2 domain. So in the fasting state, you're going to drive the reaction toward more fructose 6-phosphate and toward gluconeogenesis. But in the fed state, protein kinase A is inactive, and the PFK2 domain is active, so that drives this reaction toward fructose 2,6-bisphosphate and glycolysis. And to review, how does fructose 2,6-bisphosphate stimulate glycolysis? It stimulates PFK1, which converts fructose 6-phosphate into fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. And this is the kind of thing that makes medical students slowly go insane. Sorry. All right, let's do the end of session quiz before our heads explode. First question, what enzymes convert glucose to glucose 6-phosphate? So you have glucokinase, which is present in the liver and the beta cells of the pancreas, and hexokinase, which is found everywhere else. Next, what's the clinical consequence of a glycolytic enzyme deficiency? Well, it's hemolytic anemia, because the red cells can't generate ATP to maintain the sodium-potassium ATPase, and that's going to lead to red cell swelling and red cell lysis. Next, what enzymes are responsible for increasing and decreasing the intracellular levels of fructose 2,6-bisphosphate? So you have phosphofructokinase 2, which increases levels of fructose 2,6-bisphosphate, and fructose bisphosphatase 2 decreases levels of fructose 2,6-bisphosphate. And the last question, what's the rate-limiting enzyme in the glycolytic pathway? It's phosphofructokinase 1. All right, that's it for now. See you next time.